Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the fourth webinar in the NECAN industry webinar series. I'm Meredith White. I'm head of research and development at Mook Sea Farm, an oyster farm and hatchery in Maine. I'm also the chair of the NECAN industry working group, which has put together this webinar series. This series is designed to share information on how changes to coastal ecosystems, including ocean acidification, are affecting the aquaculture and fishing industries. Today, we'll hear from Emily Carrington about the impacts of ocean acidification on mussel bissel threads. Emily's presentation will be 40 to 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. You are welcome to submit a question during the presentation. There is a box on the right-hand side of your screen uh, titled questions where you can send in a question, um, but we'll wait until the end of the presentation to go through the questions. So to introduce you to Emily, Emily received her BS from Cornell University and Emily uh, received her PhD from Stanford University. She was a professor at the University of Rhode Island from 1995 to 2005 prior to moving to the University of Washington. She started her work on muscle attachment at the University of Rhode Island with Middleus Edulis in Narragansett Bay. Emily currently works on both wild and farmed mussel populations and collaborates with Penn Cove Shellfish on Whidbey Island, Washington. Emily served on the US Interagency Working Group for Aquaculture for two years and is currently serving as a program director at the National Science Foundation. So with that, we will move into Emily's presentation. Thank you. OK, um, so thank you, Meredith. Um, again, the title of my talk is here on the cover page, um, Losing Their Lifeline, Muscle Attachment in a Higher CO2 World. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is uh, my research over the years in two different locations, um, both on the east and west coast. Um, so just to get started with the theme of my research in general, I work on a lot of things besides mussels. Um, the general theme to our work is we're interested in how organisms are designed to live in physically demanding environments. And we work on coastal rocky shores because that's a very physically demanding environment. Um, and it's really interesting to study, study all the creatures that are able to make a living there. So what this slide shows here is a number of recent lab members um, um, ranging from high school students, undergraduates, graduate students, and postdoctoral researchers. Um, so when I say uh, it's my lab or work, or, you know, we, what I'm really saying is it's, it's these people here that are doing most of the heavy lifting with the work. There's two people in particular and I, that I want to mention because I'm going to be featuring their work today. In the bottom right is Matt George, uh, now Dr. Matt George. Um, so I'll be talking about some of his dissertation work. And also in the bottom middle is Laura Newcomb. And she uh, now works for NOAA in Washington, D.C., but I'll be featuring her dissertation work as well. So as I mentioned, we uh, study biomechanics. It might be a field that you're not that familiar with, so I just wanted to take a minute to introduce it. Um, biomechanics is a pretty big field. Um, there's a lot of people that work in the medical interest industry, and they're interested in de designing artificial heart valves, uh, maybe artificial knees. Um, and that's not what I do. I'm more of a comparative biomechanicist, meaning that I, I don't apply my work to humans so much, but rather trying to understand the natural world. So biomechanics is, is uh, the heart of that field is down here at the bottom, the interaction between the morphology of a structure and its function. Um, so in many cases, people might think of that as just the physiology of the organism. But what I like to do is to take that information and place it into the context of what the organism is experiencing in their environment. So that brings you up to the field of ecology. And I also think, like to think about how those organisms evolved those, those structures and their interaction with their environment. So that brings us into the field of evolution. So as I uh, said, what I'm going to do today is to tell you a bit about mussels. And what you see here is a a uh, nice rocky shore on the outer coast of uh, Washington state with a nice dense aggregation of mussels. 
So why would anybody care about mussels? I, I feel like I'm probably preaching to the choir here, um, but I just want to take a moment to um, pitch why mussels are important. And uh, I think this is a nice way of thinking about it, which is all of the ecosystem services that mussels provide for free. Um, this slide is just taken from an a environmental science textbook, and it's just a nice way of thinking of, about all the things that healthy eco ecosystems do. They can support, they can provision, they can regulate, and they have cultural value as well. So I just want to march through these different categories and give you a flavor of um, what mussels can do. Okay, so mussels, a healthy mussel uh, population supports and structure, structures coastal communities. As I mentioned, they make dense aggregations and lots of uh, different organisms are associated with them. So they can take what might be a hot, hard, and dry environment and the aggregation can change that local environment to make it more hospitable for other species. Mussels are also filter feeders. They can um, easily filter um, up to a liter of water per hour. Um, and so by doing so in dense aggregations, they can regulate water quality. Um, so what you're seeing here with this slide is on the left is typical um, estuary, uh, bay water. Um, it can be murky and full of particulate matter. And there's no mussels in that particular tank. And what you see on the right was the same water, but with a few bivalves put in there. And um, this is what it looks like after just a few hours. So um, again, mussels can regulate water quality. And they're very important for um, what we say, coupling the pelagic environment, the, the water column, with benthic habitats. And that's because they're drawing down all the food and particulate matter and bringing it to the, the bottom environment and transferring that into food and other essential um, nutrients that can work their way up the food chain. Mussels also provide food. I think a lot of people in this audience would be aware of that. Um, so this is a slide to show um, a little bit about the mussel farming practices. Typically, it's done by suspension culture. So on the top left, we see mussel rafts floating in the water. From those rafts will be ropes that dangle down into the water column, and that's what you see on the top right with lots of mussels attached to those ropes. Um, when the mussels have grown to market size, they are brought onto some sort of harvesting barge, and that's what you're seeing down on the bottom here with a, a grower stripping the mussels off of those ropes and putting them in a bin. And the mussels then get um, separated, scrubbed up, um, they remove the viscous, and then they are um, put into bags and shipped out to um, to market. Uh, so typically, um, many of the growers, at least in Washington State, are doing just-in-time um, harvesting, and the product makes it to the table in about uh, 48 hours. So it's literally a farm-to-table industry here. So just to give you an idea of how important this aquaculture industry is, um, I pulled this slide from um, FAO publication a couple of years ago. And uh, what it's showing is um, the status of marine capture in orange over the past 15 years. And I think you can see that it is a uh, a uh, fairly high, uh, 80 million tons, but it's quite static. We haven't seen any change in, over time. In contrast, um, we see in blue, mariculture and coastal aquaculture. And so uh, that's in blue. It is a smaller value overall relative to the marine capture, but um, it is um, on the rise. And so when we think about moving forward and how to generate more food to feed the world, um, in many uh, cases, the view is that we're fairly maxed out with marine capture, and uh, the greatest um, promise for generating more food will, become, will be coming from coastal aquaculture practices. So mussels are important, um, an important industry. Um, they often are dominant in industries in various communities, and so for that reason, they have high cultural value. Uh, this picture is a slide from Vigo, Spain, which is um, a very uh, strong aquaculture community, and they grow most of the uh, mussels for for Europe. Um, so why I like this picture is it's a tourism um, shot of their, their scenic uh, ria, 
in the middle of their, their region. And what you can see on the left is a shipping channel, but on the right, all those little specks are mussel rafts. Um, and so in this community, and I was visiting there, um, there's a lot of pride for mussel aquaculture. Uh, and you can see on the right, um, one of the growers uh, there, uh, we had the opportunity to visit their operation and they brought their kids. And I always keep in mind that um, often muscle farming, muscle growing is a cross-generational um, operation. And I, I keep in mind that it's important to understand this industry and to do what we can to keep it, um, be good stewards of the industry for the next generation. Muscles, um, have uh, other cultural value. Um, on the left here, you see a Coast Salish uh, native, a First Nations woman um, collecting mussels for a ceremonial um, dinner. And then um, on the right are a couple of slides um, put together um, from my visit um, to this woman in black on the bottom. And, and her name is um, Chiara Vigo, and she calls herself the maestro of business. Um, she's 34 fifth generation artisan who harvests the byssus, um, these tiny golden threads from Pinna nobilis, weaves them together and makes uh, various uh, needlework, um, so, so tapestries and weavings. And so uh, what you can see in that, that particular picture is um, she was just done weaving a fiber and she's wrapping around that girl's um, finger, and um, that was part of her ceremony. Um, and then on the left is her holding up one of her weavings. She's holding it up into the sun, um, and it's a beautiful golden color. So her work and that of her ancestors have been uh, on display in uh, a number of museums in uh, Europe, including the Louvre, um, and it is part of the heritage of this part of Italy. Okay, so that gives you an idea of why mussels are so often awesome. They support, they provide, they re regulate, and they provide uh, cultural value. There's a good group of people out there who really don't like mussels, and so that's what this slide is to um, here to portray. Uh, mussels can get um, into intake pipes, uh, so they come in as larvae and they grow quickly, and so that can cause problems for a lot of coastal coastal factories, they get um, into impellers of motors, they attach to ship hulls and the propellers, and they attach to moorings that are offshore. So they're really a nuisance. Um, I've been to a lot of biofouling um, meetings, and they talk about the drag penalty, the penalty of having extra mussels growing on um, their, their ships um, that increase the force that they need to either move through the water or to keep them um, in place. So there, there's a lot of interest by the Navy and, and um, other industries to understand how muscles attach so that they can prevent them from doing so. So how do muscles attach? Um, not many people have stared at muscles behaving um, in an, an aquarium, but that's something I like to do. And what we see uh, in this movie that's looping through is a, a video of a, a, that took a couple of minutes. Um, you see half of a muscle. They're sticking their foot out and pushing it against a glass wall. And you can see um, first there's a white spot, and that's where the muscle is extruding some material to make the glue that attaches to the glass. And then in the, the groove of the foot, there's um, also material that's making the fiber. So over the course of, the, of minutes, um, the f abyssal thread goes from being liquid to a solid. The animal takes its foot away, um, and that thread continues to cure. So mussels make these threads one at a time over and over and over again. Um, and again, it takes about five minutes to make one. And Many of these fibers collectively in an array represent the attachment of the, mus the, the, of the muscle. And so we call um, an aggregation of bissel threads um, a byssus. So that's what you see in gold in the uh, picture at the bottom. Okay, so what's interesting and what got me uh, interested in studying muscles is that there are times when muscle attachment is not strong enough. So uh, 
In natural populations, mussels will become dislodged and form patches in those beds, and that's something that we see here on the left. Um, or in aquaculture settings, mussels will fall off and uh, mussel growers lose a lot of their profits. And so that's what we're seeing on the right. This is a grower in Spain showing uh, bare patches on those uh, the mussel ropes. So anywhere from 20 to 35 percent of a mussel population can be lost annually. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, generally, at least in natural settings, the assumption is that dislodgement equals death. Um, mussels need to stay attached um, to to survive. Uh, if they become detached, they quickly either become food for other organisms like crabs, lobsters, or fish, or they get washed up on shore and um, they dry out and die. Um, so what this slide is showing is a, a huge mortality event um, after a large storm in Connecticut. And what you're seeing is um, about the expanse of a football field, several hundred meters, a couple several meters of shoreline that are a, a few meters high in mussel shells. So these were mussels that recently had been attached to, to hard substrate, and the storm came in and brought them, ripped them off their substrate, and, and they landed on shore. So what I was interested in is trying to uh, estimate whether biomechanics would be a useful tool to predict this process. Of, of mussel uh, dislodgement. Can we predict when it's going to happen and how many would be dislodged? So my approach um, was to use something called ecological biomechanics. Um, and I uh, started out by realizing that mussel dislodgement was simply a problem of uh, understanding the biomaterials that they use to attach and understanding the hydrodynamic forces that they see. So engineers do this all the time. They, they measure the strength of biomaterials, and they can um, estimate, uh, use fluid dynamical theory to estimate hydrodynamic forces. So I borrowed those two tools to ask, when does muscle attachment um, not withstand the hydrodynamic forces that they see? So just to give you a brief glimpse of how we can do this, um, for a little bit about the hydrodynamic forces that mussels see, what we do know from lots of different studies as, is that mussels typically see the forces of lift and drag. Um, drag comes when a, a wave comes, in this case, from the right, and it's pushing the, the mussels downstream. And lift comes when that water scoots over the top, and when it does that, it's rerouted and speeds up. Higher flow means a lower pressure, and this tends to um, pull the muscles away from their substrate, and we call this force lift. This is the same force that keeps airplanes aloft when they're flying. So um, those are some of the equations that we can use to estimate lift. Um, I won't go through that in too much detail, um, only to say this, the first part of the equation, one half rho and u, that has to do with the water. Rho is the, the density of the fluid, and U is the how fast it's moving. So that's something we can measure about the water. And A and C have to do with the size and shape of the organism. So in this case, it's the area exposed to those forces. And C has to do with a drag coefficient or a lift coefficient. And that simply describes how that shape interacts with the flow. Those are things that we can measure in the laboratory with uh, things like uh, flow tunnels. Okay, so um, the other thing we needed to know was how strong muscles were attached out in the field, and I've done this a lot, both um, on the East Coast and the West Coast. Typically, the way we'll do that is go and drill a hole through the shell, put a fishing hook through there, and uh, pull the muscle off with a, a recording spring scale or a force transducer. So we can measure the force in newtons that the muscles attached with, and we know because um, bigger muscles are smaller than are stronger than small muscles, we normalize that force to the size and we get an estimate of attachment strength. So to get at um, what those water velocities are that they're experiencing, um, I have measured water velocities in many locations. Um, it's fairly time consuming and a nice shortcut is to use offshore buoys or um, these uh, 
bottom mountain pressure sensors um, that Seabird makes um, to measure the wave heights off offshore. And if we know the wave height coming onto the mussels, we can then estimate the water velocities generated by those waves. And from there, we can estimate those forces. So that just gives you an idea of um, how I measure forces of mussels in the field and how I estimate the environmental conditions that they see. So how do I put this together? When I've measured uh, the, the many attachment forces for a population of mussels, what I know is that some are strong and some are weak, and so there's a distribution of strength that's represented by this bell curve. Um, so most of the um, individuals will be that intermediate strength, but there's some that are a little bit weaker to the left and some that are a little bit stronger to the right. So what I can do from either measuring the uh, water velocities directly or estimating the forces from the buoys is I can estimate what's the maximum wave stress that a population of mussels might experience over a given amount of time. And that's represented by this black line. So what you can then infer is that um, on the left side of that line, those are all the weak mussels and they're gonna be knocked off by that wave. They're gonna fail we would say in engineering terms. But the ones on the, on the right, those are the stronger of the population and they're gonna be safe and, and, stay, and stay put over that time period. So in this way, we can estimate the fraction of a population that would fail and that would be my um, estimate of the fraction of the population that are dislodged. So in a scenario where, where we see increased wave stress, something like going from summer to winter, we would predict that you would see increased failure. So the, the area under that curve increases. So that was my model. I went and uh, applied this model, went out and measured uh, attachment strengths and measured wave heights and also measured uh, muscle mortality uh, in Narragansett Bay. This was when I was at the University of Rhode Island. So the data that I'm showing here are for Middleus edgeless. Um, so first I want you to focus on what my predictions were. And those are in the black bars. Uh, and this would be over three years. And what you're seeing is my predictions for how much muscle mortality you should see um, by separated by each month. And what I hope you can tell immediately is that there's not much action happening from January to June, but that we do see fairly high predictions of dislodgement for September and October. The gray bars are what I actually observed in the population, and that's going um, every two weeks and taking pictures of uh, the same locations and simply asking when do these gaps in the muscle beds appear. So um, I hope what you can appreciate is there's pretty good ag agreement between the predicted dislodgement and what we actually measured. Um, not perfect agreement, but that R squared is telling you that about 83% of the variation in uh, monthly mortality over those three years is predicted um, by the, the model, the biomechanical model. And interestingly, uh, most of this fall off is happening late in, um, late in the summer, early fall, uh, particularly in September and October. So that was a bit of a surprise to me that the fall off was happening in September and October. As I mentioned, um, I was assuming that when um, we were gonna predict dislodgement, it was gonna occur when that wave stress increases over time. So when that black bar moves to the right. Um, but what I showed you is January, February, and March actually didn't have very much dislodgement. So we know for sure there's big winter storms then, but they weren't causing much um, dislodgement. So in, in going through this exercise, what I instead learned, and I hadn't thought about prior to that, is that the actual distribution of muscle strength changes over time. And so the increased failure that we saw was not so much a change in the wave stress, but rather a change in the distributions of strength. So that blue bar, the blue bell-shaped curve was shifting to the left. The whole population was becoming weaker. And that's why we see um, a greater area of, under the curve filled in. And that's why we see increased failure. So just to give you an idea of, of what was happening with attachment strength, and again, this is for uh, Middleus Edgeless in Rhode Island, um, a summary of six years of data. 
Um, there's a strong seasonal cycle in muscle attachment. They're quite strong from January through June. And at the end of summer, like clockwork, they become very weak, um, really two times weaker in late summer. And this is when they're most susceptible to these fall off events. Um, it turns out that that's uh, September and October and a little bit of November, that's hurricane season. So in years when there's a lot of hurricane activity or, or early season storm activity, that causes the most damage to muscle populations. So this finding um, got me really interested in what's driving this seasonal cycle in attachment. And uh, I can just stop right now and say I don't really know the answer. But uh, after about 15 years of work, both in the laboratory and in the field, we're honing in on um, some of the culprits. So um, at this time, I ha had been in Rhode Island, but I moved to the University of Washington. and um, I had the opportunity to develop a new laboratory to look at how a number of uh, different environmental conditions could um, affect marine organisms. And this picture on the left is uh, showing uh, part of that laboratory. Uh, one of the main things we were interested in at the time was ocean acidification. But in fact, we set up this laboratory to look at a lot of different environmental factors. Um, so we were able to look at m mussels and these um, controlled mixing reservoirs to manipulate pH, temperature, or food supply. And mostly what I'll talk about today is pH and temperature. So basically what we would do, um, you can see these igloo coolers there. Inside those coolers are chambers which could hold um, individual mussels under different conditions. We'd put them there from anywhere from three days to maybe six weeks ask the mussels to uh, produce bissel threads, and they, they obliged. We harvested the bissel threads, brought them to um, my materials uh, testing laboratory, and that's what you can see on the right. That shiny wand in the middle is a bissel thread um, that's held between two grips, and it's in a bucket of water. So a materials tester simply pulls that on that thread slowly and measures the force it takes to break it. And from that, we can estimate bissel thread strength. So we've done that a lot um, for different mussel species under different conditions. And um, the take home message is from the title that you see here on this uh, journal cover, um, is that mussels lose their grip. And specifically, the ones that we have um, been able to identify is ocean acidification and ocean warming both weaken mussel byssus. Specifically, um, ocean acidification, the, the text that you see in blue, makes muscle byssus 40% weaker if the pH drops below 7.6. And we also learned that that's a um, affecting the plaque of the thread, and that's the part of the thread that's making the attachment to the substrate. In contrast, um, ocean warming, we see a much stronger effect. Um, and in this case, when temperature goes above 18 degrees uh, for Middleus chocolis, that the uh, anal the abyssus becomes 70% weaker, and we localize that effect to the proximal region. Now, one of the reasons I bothered to tell you what part of the abyssus these two stressors are affecting is because it helps us um, think about how these two stressors might work in combination. And, and this is one of the the more difficult things to do with um, environmental science is um, and, and laboratory experiments. It's easy to do single factor experiments, just pH or just temperature, um, but much more difficult to um, look at the effects of combinations of factors, the kinds of combinations that we'd really see in the real world. So um, Gunderson et al. had a nice uh, review paper recently um, that set up a framework for thinking about how mu multiple stressors would interact. And I've shown a graph here just to show you um, what the effects might be for single stressors. Stressor one, in this case, it might be temperature, or stressor two, which might be PCO2 or, or pH, really the same thing. And what this is showing is what the performance detriment, how bad that stressor would be to whatever um, aspect of the organism um, you're interested in. So um, the theory says that there's different ways these stressors might combine to affect 
uh, a structure. So they could be additive. You can simply add the the, the effects, um, and, and the total the combined effect would be the sum of those. Or you might get an effect that's greater than the sum of the parts, and we would call that synergistic. Or you might get something um, that's antagonistic. So perhaps that they're the, those stressors are interacting, and one is going to be ameliorating the effects of another, and we would call that an antagonistic interaction. So I think that's a really great framework, um, but I also think that we can do a little bit better with muscle bisous because we know a little bit more. I've put here a picture in the right um, that shows stressor one and stressor two loosely affecting, generally affecting um, the structure, and, and I'm representing it as a chain. And uh, this really could be our muscle bisous with the different parts of a bissel thread. So the diagram for, for Gunderson really applies well when those two stressors are co-located, when they're really working on the same part of the organism. But that's not the case for muscle bisous. What I had told you already is that stressor one, in this case temperature, acts on one part of the bissel thread, whereas stressor two interact, uh, affects a different part. So there's really no scenario where those two stressors can physically um, amplify each other or inhibit each other. So when you think about how they would work in combination, it's simply going to be the larger effect is going to drive the performance of the whole thing. Literally, it's the weakest link that's going to determine the strength of that chain. So in our case, we know that uh, stressor one, the temperature effect, is stronger. And so we would predict in combination that we would only see that effect um, displayed and that the effect of the, the other stressor would be masked. And the reason I uh, bring this up is for those of you who are interested in um, thinking about what, how uh, multiple stressors can interact, um, I think it's really important to pinpoint um, the mechanisms about of, of how those stressors are affecting these organisms and literally what types of tissues, what types of processes they're affecting, and only then can we develop more meaningful models of uh, how they would, would be interacting. And this is going to be really important for uh, how we evaluate the data that we're collecting. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, we have uh, chased uh, in some detail um, what the effects are for different environmental conditions in the plaque in particular. So this is the work of uh, Matt George, and I think um, it's been pretty exciting, so I want to go into that in more detail. So one of the things, uh, one of the reasons why Matt got interested in the plaque and the effect of pH on it comes from other work that was done um, by researchers uh, at UC Santa Barbara and elsewhere. And um, in this case, these are protein biochemists, and they have been for two decades uh, identifying the proteins that muscles produce um, in the byssus and trying to um, design artificial materials that could be used um, for biomedical industry. Um, Turns out biomedical, the biomedical industry is really interested in designing glues that will um, attach to wet surfaces, those kinds of surfaces that we see in the human body. So um, what we do know about muscles, uh, we see a foot here, and as I showed in the video, what they're going to do is put their foot against the surface um, of a substrate, in this case represented by that mica, and they're going to excrete some proteins that uh, will form an adhesive. So when they do this, the muscle pushes against that surface and actually changes the pH of that local distal depression. And um, they've been able to estimate the pH is around two or three. So that's shown here on the right. In red, the pH of the distal depression is quite low. Turns out that's really important because the proteins that they are extruding um, will not bind to each other, and they instead will attach to the surface that they are their their final target. So if a muscle didn't lower the pH, then their glue would actually never get to its destination. It would glom up in the muscle's foot. So that's a really clever trick um, that the muscles are able to do to, to be able to effectively dispense 
um, their adhesives. So then when the animal takes its foot away, suddenly it's put in fresh seawater. The pH of seawater is about eight. And it turns out that pH is essential for causing the crosslinks um, of these adhesives. And those are the, um, so things like MFP5 and MFP3, um, those then will now start to um, combine and attach to each other. And that's what's needed for the adhesive to actually become a material. Um, so there's really two parts to, to forming these adhesive plaques. The first step is making um, adhesion to the surface, and the second part is cohesion um, to make an uh, adhesive material. So and, uh, it's the change in pH uh, that triggers this process. So um, when I showed earlier that we know that uh, low, low pH weakens muscle attachment, um, our initial hypothesis was that it's because there's something about um, the pH of the environment that's acting on living muscles and causing them to produce bad materials. Um, and I think uh, that's still highly possible and likely, but there's also another scenario, and that's the one what, what Matt was thinking about. So what Matt knew from some of his experiments is this process of um, adhesive plaque maturation. This is where these crosslinks are forming and setting up that, that plaque material. It can take a really long time. So initially on the left, a brand new um, adhesive plaque is actually white. Um, and over the course of many days, we see that uh, molecule DOPA turns into a DOPA quinone um, when the pH is eight, and we call this tanning. And literally the adhesive plaque becomes more golden brown. And what Matt has been able to show um, is that they get stronger when they do this. So he had the idea that there could be um, this uh, important um, mechanism of the environment involved in the post-processing of the material. So that is maybe an animal produces abyssal thread, but the type of water that it's exposed to will determine whether that's a, a successful strong material. Okay, so what uh, Matt needed to do first was to understand um, what type of water conditions um, we could see at muscle farms. And uh, we, Laura Newcomb has been working with this as well. Um, and she's here on the right, and what she's showing is a, a YSI data sond, um, something that measures water temperature, pH, chlorophyll, dissolved oxygen, and salinity. And we were able to deploy these at uh, muscle farm at, in Washington State. Um, and this is a collaboration with Penn Cove Mussels, Penn Cove Shellfish, excuse me. And uh, on the left is Ian Jefford, Jefford, so he's the president of that company. Um, and it wasn't just us being able to put that together. We also collaborated with um, Department of Natural Resources. Sea Grant was helpful with funding, as was the National Science Foundation. And these data were hosted by um, a NANUS platform as well. So uh, what we did is to put these sensors below the mussel rafts in and amongst where the mussels live. And uh, we also, um, on some occasions, had our own homemade sensors, and we put those in aggregations of mussels, um, really right in the mussel aggregations um, to see what the water conditions were there. And we did this both at one meter and seven meters. Now, I'm not going to show you all of that data, but I can summarize it with this slide here, is that we learned that mussels experience an awful lot of variability in their uh, water conditions compared to open ocean conditions or even um, conditions that are just uh, uh, out in uh, more op open water conditions within uh, the Salish Sea or the Puget Sound, if you want to call it. Um, so typically, uh, these mussel growers are working in uh, relatively small enclosed embayments, and there's huge fluctuations in the water conditions. So temperature um, over the course of the year can range from 5 to 24 degrees Celsius. Salinity is generally high, but we get episodes of um, 
freshwater runoff, that, and so salinity can drop down to zero. pH fluctuates um, a lot, often uh, even within a day, and um, we see different pH conditions at the surface than just seven meters down, and the range we've observed is anywhere from four to nine. And similarly, a lot of uh, variation in dissolved oxygen. So um, often it's very well oxygenated, but we do see periods of, of hypoxia. So what Matt was interested in is um, which aspects of the seawater environment might impact muscle attachment. And so what he did is to take muscles that were in oceanic conditions, you know, our ambient good conditions, ask those muscles to make bissel threads, and then put them in different types of seawater, some that were, were ambient conditions, some that might have low pH or low dissolved oxygen, um, and look at that maturation process. So again, there's, there's no animal involved uh, in well, once you change the seawater treatment. So then what Matt did um, over time is to do some mechanical testing. So this is the same machine I showed you before. Um, and this is the type of data he would get. He'd uh, pull on these plaques um, and as they stretch it and uh, measure the uh, maximum force it took to pull them off the substrate. So this summarizes um, a lot of his experiments here. Um, so what you see on the y-axis is adhesive plaque strength, the information that came from the materials testing machine. And he was testing these plaques um, either uh, at zero days, so um, all of the treatments were pretty much at that same value of around uh, 60 kilopascals, and then watch the maturation over time. So in control conditions, again, that would be the ambient seawater conditions, that's the plot that you see in light gray, and you see that the adhesive becomes stronger and stronger over time and plateaus um, after eight to 12 days. In high temperature, and this is pretty high temperature, and low salinity, hyposalinity, uh, and Matt chose these to really push the limits of, of what the environment could do to an adhesive plaque, um, you can see that there's not much of an effect. So, uh, in fact, there's no statistical difference between those values that you see and the control. So we conclude that high temperature and low salinity don't have an effect on the plaque itself. In contrast, ocean acidification, a pH of 3 in this case, and hypoxia um, have a deleterious effect on the plaques. They just never did quite mature. Um, it, it keeps them in this... Uh, early stage um, and they don't tan. So just to look at this a different way to show you what the effect of pH is after 12 days, um, we can see a plot that shows what the strength of a thread would, of the plaque would be um, if it's held in different types of pH. So this is this graph on the left. So on the right-hand side is high pH, what you would see in ambient seawater, and you see that the uh, plaques are very strong. But as you move to the left, we're now moving to more acidic conditions, and we see a strong effect of weakening on those plaques. Um, I'll skip the plot in the middle, but it's interesting. And uh, what I wanted to show you is on the right-hand side, in a pH of 8, um, that's what a a normal plaque would look like um, after 12 days. When uh, Matt held them in lower pH conditions, you can see that the tanning process was not complete. And also we got a bit of discoloration. So there's some heavy metals that seem to be precipitating um, out under those low pH conditions. So the other um, interesting question is, uh, so one, th one of the conclusions of that from this work of Matt is that low pH and low dissolved, o dissolved oxygen are really bad. Um, and Matt was curious um, whether this effect was reversible. So maybe they could encounter um, poor conditions, but maybe if they don't last very long, that the, the material might be able to stiffen up and become strong. So the data you see here is um, from uh, a pH sensor that Matt put in a muscle aggregation just a few centimeters away from them. 
um, relative to the raft sensor, which was maybe a meter away from the muscles. So the line in black shows a, a, a fairly stable pH condition. It moves around a little bit um, at most a pH, uh, one pH unit. In contrast, this dotted line shows what can happen in and around the muscles. In, and this is really the area of interest because this is where they're making their bissel threads. Um, and you and see a very different story here. There's uh, about four units of fluctuation in pH. Um, and so you can get down to a pH of four, uh, and it might last for um, anywhere from uh, a day or two. So Matt was curious whether this short-term fluctuation would have an effect on the adhesive plaques. Um, I don't have time to go into all of that data because uh, the experiments are fairly complicated um, and not easy on the eye, but I can tell you that the effect is re reversible in some cases and not in others. Um, so it turns out with pH, um, once I've already shown you that pH can prevent the maturation process, but if you um, come back a few days later with a high pH, then the, the plaque will in fact mature and stay strong, and it's really locked into that state. In contrast, uh, a low DO doesn't have any effect. Um, uh, let's see, low, low oxygen. Um, can delay the maturation process. If you do um, let it mature under high oxygenated conditions, but then put it back in low DO, um, it will uh, weaken again. So it seems that the fluctuations in low dissolved oxygen really could have recurring problems for muscle attachment, whereas um, in the case of pH, muscles would be able to really lock in a, a, a good attachment. So this really does make me worry quite a bit um, about low dissolved oxygen. So to summarize, um, what I've told you is that there's many different environmental stressors that weaken muscle bissel threads. Um, we know ocean acidification will do it, ocean warming, um, and we're now also worried about hypoxia. Um, when applied concurrently, it's the stressor with the strong, strongest effect that dominates. So I think because temperature and pH are affecting different parts of the bissel thread, they're not going to actually um, combine to make things even worse. Um, but that will not be the case so much with uh, hypoxia and uh, pH. We know that environmental post-processing is required for strong adhesive plaque maturation. Um, we, we also are not ruling out nutritional or reprodu reproductive influences um, on uh, weakening muscle attachment, but we do know um, that we can't rule out the effect of just the water column itself. And so when we take all of this information and think about uh, the predictions for having uh, future oceans that will be a couple of degrees warmer or a couple of, um, or, uh, have lower pH or uh, increased hypoxia, um, that the prediction would be that these shifts would likely weaken muscles and increase their mortality. So I've uh, presented some of this work uh, in various places and had the opportunity to talk to various reporters and politicians, and I just wanted to show you some of these examples. Um, and here's one of the headlines um, from that, which says mussels will be off the menu within 85 years due to climate change. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say that uh, the conversations with this reporter very much stimulated some of the work that I had done since then. Um, at the time of speaking with the reporter, I had only done a lot of um, some laboratory experiments, and those conversations and the questions that that uh, he asked stimulated me to go um, do a little bit more modeling and incorporate some um, uh, some of the, the um, information on how uh, the, fi the finances of the farm to see if, if, if um, what we were finding really was going to make a difference. And so really one of the key questions that came from the reporter was, great, muscles are going to become uh, weaker and fall off, but how much fall off can a muscle grower 
with stand. Um, so that's still a work in progress, but I just wanted to point out um, how valuable I have found to speak with reporters um, and that they really are asking excellent questions and pushing us to do research in a different type of way. Um, I've also had the chance to talk to politicians. Um, this is a slide from uh, a couple of years ago um, when our governor in Washington state came out to visit, visit the mussel farm. And that's me being a typical science, rattling off all the cool things that our um, environmental sensors are measuring, things like chlorophyll and dissolved oxygen and pH. Um, and what Governor Inslee said is, you know, that's really great. I get it. Now, here's what I need to know is what is going to happen to our jobs. People are care about this industry. It's really important for sustaining our rural economy. And what I need to know to take back to the leg legislature is what will our oceans look like in 100 years. Um, and so uh, I realize that's a little bit uncomfortable for a research biologist to think about uh, making predictions about the future and our economy. But um, I, these types of co hard questions and conversations have really pushed me to um, have the confidence to give my best answer. And I think that uh, that is incumbent on us as researchers to be providing that information. So here's my answer based on what I know today for Governor Inslee and whoever else will listen, is that yes, we should be worried. Um, I think we should especially be worried about ocean warming. That seems to be the stronger effect that we're seeing on mussel business. I think in future oceans, mussels are going to be weaker and they're going to die. And I think that gr growers' profits will decline as a result. And so one of my pitches to any of you who are scientists or research, even resource managers, is keep continue this conversation between industry managers and scientists. Um, the scientists really need to be listening to these questions and, and thinking about how their, um, their findings and their R squareds and P values are going to tie into decisions that uh, people need to make for the future. And with that, I would love to take questions, and I'm not positive I know how. That's fine, Emily. I'm going to run the question and answer session. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful, informative presentation, and we already have some questions that have come in, and I invite those who are still on the line to send in more questions through the question box, which is one of the sections of the GoToWebinar control panel. So um, we'll start off with uh, the several questions came in during your presentation. And we have a question from Joseph Kunkel. Do mussels often attach actually to each other's shells? Yes, they do. Especially even the picture that I'm showing on my last slide. I think, is it still there? Yes. Um, yeah, so growers will put... Uh, they seed the ropes, literally, what they call it mussel seed, but they're maybe a few millimeters long at that point. And um, they're so small that they can directly t attach to the ropes. As they grow bigger and bigger, they get pushed out and, and many of them can't touch the rope anymore. They can't reach it. And so all they have is each other to hold on to. Okay. Um, also from Joseph Kunkel, uh, does mussel detachment anticipate reproduction? I like, for example, making more room for larger or more healthy adults. And I believe this is in reference to your uh, graph that showed the decline in uh, mussel attachment in summer months. So that's an excellent question, and I I think. Um, it's sort of a chicken and the egg question, but I think there's a lot to it. Mussels, uh, let's see, middleus, trosselus, and edulis, the bay mussels, um, we would call them a weedy species. That, that means that they live fast and die young. Um, so compared to um, the outer coast species in Washington, middleus californianus tends to be longer lived. Hmm. Turns out that the bay mussels uh, have overall weaker attachment and they're more susceptible to this dislodgement. Um, and it kind of plays into their life history. It's okay that they leave a 
they uh, lose a third of their population because they reproduce a lot. And there is now going to be space and recruits coming in the next year to fill in those, those spaces. Um, so in contrast, Middle East Californianist doesn't invest as much in, in reproduction, that they uh, are more episodic from year to year, whether they're going to have a good recruitment year. Um, and it just so happens they tend to be a lot stronger and longer lived. So I, th I do think that there's um, that goes hand in hand, the reproductive strategy and the investment in these structural materials. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, will mussels attach to marble or calcite or aragonite? And will the low pH clear the calcium carbonate at the site of attachment? So mussels will attach to pretty much anything, um, and that is the bane of all of the biofouling community. Um, if they knew what, what things like mussels and barnacles would not attach to, they would make all their ships out of it right away. Um, so that, so mussels will attach to anything. Now, and the question is, um, are you thinking about calcite and aragonite and how they might come out of solution easier? Hmm. I, I don't know that there's a difference in the attachment strength to either of those materials. So um, I see where you're headed with that, but I don't have a lot to offer. <laughs> in terms of information on it? It's an interesting question. Okay, thank you. And uh, we are, I have one final question. Uh, if anyone else sends in a question while Emily's answering this one, that would be great. Um, my question is, have you talked with any of the researchers who are looking into growing seaweeds around uh, mussel farms? And uh, I know that some have seen a pH effect of growing the seaweeds. And I wonder if it could be modeled how that would impact the muscle attachment in the farms and if the, if this change in pH would help the uh, muscle farmers maintain their crops. Right. Um, I overall think it's a great idea. Um, so in general, seaweeds should be um, pulling um, in nutrients and um, carbon, so they should be able to uh, reduce, the, to increase the pH of the water. Um, that said, they can also cause huge fluctuations, um, and we've seen that a lot of the, the fluctuations that we see at the farm is due to the photosynthetic um, microalgae that are in the water column, and so we see really high pH in the daytime and really low pH um, at night. So um, it's not a slam dunk that it's going to work. Um, it could simply be causing more fluctuations um, there that might be harder harder for the animals. But overall, I, th I think it's a really great idea. Um, I also know that there's a lot of um, nutrients associated with mussels and kelp love, love that, as do um, red algae. And so that would be a really nice way to um, recycle some of those nutrients and put it into some useful product. And extracting that out of the water column, I think, would be would be excellent. So I'm all for this type of practice. Great. Thank you so much, Emily, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you to everyone who stuck with us through the te technical difficulties in the beginning. I am really happy to say that we did not lose any attendees during that. So thank you to everyone. And uh, we, you will hear an announcement about the next webinar in this series, uh, which I believe is in November. And with that, we'll let you get on to the rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much.